Welcome to week three of our sermon series, How to Deal. About 18 months ago, I had my first real experience with anxiety. Uh, I've always been kind of a a logical, rational, black and white kind of guy. Um, Emotions don't come really easy for me, so for almost 40 years of my life, anxiety was kind of an odd thing that I didn't get uh, until about 18 months ago. Uh, I was actually working with a vocal coach down near Milwaukee, a really good guy who was helping me fix some bad habits with my voice. And I was standing in his living room while he encouraged me to try this or to, to tweak that, and And suddenly, for reasons I can't explain, I started to feel my body and my brain start to unravel. Um, I started sweating. My breathing got shallow. And at one point, I kind of noticed that my toes were curled up inside of my shoes and standing vertical. Uh, He kind of noticed something was up and he said, are you okay? And I couldn't find any logical way to explain why I was feeling what I was feeling. I just knew that I I had to leave, and so I did. Uh, I ended the lesson early. Uh, I was driving home with my wife, and she said, what what happened? And I said, I I don't really know. It didn't seem very logical, but I can tell you it was very emotional, and it felt extremely powerful which is kind of what anxiety is. Uh, There's a lot of you here today who can relate to that story because according to the National Alliance of Mental Illness, anxiety is the number one mental health struggle in America. About 20% of U.S. adults don't deal with the occasional nervousness or worry, but with a constant, almost daily battle with intrusive and negative thoughts. 20%. I mean, look at all of you here today. That's about one of you, and one of you, one of you, one of you, two of you. And that's just the adults. You may have heard that anxiety statistically seems to be skyrocketing in our social media age where more kids, more teens, especially young women, seem to be battling these fears and worries all the time. Uh, In case you're not familiar, anxiety isn't like the nervousness you feel before a first date. Uh, It's not being nervous about a a public speech or a big presentation at work. Um, Clinical chronic anxiety is when you deal with intrusive thoughts on a constant basis. You know, for most of us, uh, a fear is like a little snowflake. And it falls on the warm cement of logic and then it's gone. But for people who struggle with anxiety, that snowflake, you know, what if this happens, starts to quickly snowball, like the the packy snow outside today. And it becomes an avalanche that just kind of takes over and and train wrecks otherwise good days when you're honestly really blessed by God. Uh, Or to put it another way, for most of us, worry and fear is like a scary loop in a roller coaster, but then the roller coaster moves on. But people with anxiety get caught in the loop. It's a fear, and then it's another fear, and it's what if this, and then what if that, and then what if this happens, and what if this gets worse, and what if, and what if, and what if, and you, you can't get out of the ride, and it, uh, it kind of turns your stomach, and makes you feel sick, it keeps you up at night, it makes your head hurt. And even though from the outside perspective, you're so blessed, and life is so good, it doesn't feel that way on the inside. Like my experience with the vocal coach, it's not logical, but it is extremely powerful. And it's important for us to know that anxiety happens here too, in the Christian church. In fact, according to some people, anxiety can actually be worse for Christians because we Christians don't just worry about our health and our finances and our families and our country. We also worry about worry. Now, most Christians know that Jesus said, don't worry. Uh, Trust in God. We know that we should, but we don't, and that makes us worry even more. Like, what if after all these years, my constant worry is the proof that I'm not really worthy? That my faith isn't strong enough? That God actually is angry? How many times have I read the passage, recited it, gone to church, and here I am still worrying about these things? I don't trust God. Maybe I'm not good enough. And and so within the church, anxiety can snowball and become even worse. Yeah, I could easily think of, of 10 people in our church family that I respect 
who are rooted, who you'll see every Sunday, who sincerely love Jesus, and they sincerely question if they're going to make it to heaven. So how do you deal with that? If that's your story, how do you deal? And if this is the story of someone you know and love, someone in your life group, someone in your extended family, the person you're dating, the person you're raising, the one that you're married to, how do you deal with that? I got to tell you, as a guy who's pretty logical and rational most of the time and loves to be very biblical, for most of my life, I have not known a helpful way to deal with anxiety. My response has been, well, that's not going to happen. Now let me read you a Bible passage. Do not be anxious, Philippians 4, quote, you're welcome, let's pray. <laughs> um, but i got to tell you, in the last few years, as anxiety has gotten closer and closer to home, uh, I've realized what doesn't work and what does. And I've realized that addressing any spiritual issue is not as easy as taking half a Bible passage but studying everything that God has to say. And so that's what I want to do with you today. Um, In the Bible, there are 30 different passages that use words like worry, worried, anxious, or anxiety. We're going to look at a bunch of them today. And I'm also going to share with you a bunch of stories of brothers and sisters in our church family who have to deal with anxiety all the time, and I want to share with you how they do it. Uh, We're going to cover four blanks today if you're taking notes in your program. Uh, Before we get to our first blank, real quickly though, I need to say this. Um, Today's message will not fix anyone's anxiety. Because that's not how faith works. If I claim to have a sermon that would fix your pride in 30 minutes, you would give an incredible offering to hear that. (laughs) You know, let's fix jealousy or impatience, right? So parts of our Christian life are like fruit, we say at our church. We're going to plant a seed today. And my hope is that you learn enough truth and enough Bible passages and enough helpful tips that you can water and fertilize that seed. So maybe, maybe not today or tomorrow, but six months from now, you'll know how to deal. And even if your worries don't disappear, you'll know from a biblical perspective what to do with them. So that's our plan. Four points, how to deal with anxiety. If you're taking notes, uh, here's the first point. The place I think you should always start when you're anxious, when someone you love is anxious, is this. Breathe. You might think I'm a heretic for what I'm about to say. But I think before you open your Bible, you should breathe. Here's why I say that. Have you ever met a two-year-old who's about three hours past his nap time? (laughs) Mom just looked at dad. (laughs) Do you sit down with that child and say, you know, you're being very crabby. You're not respecting your father. Let's go to church and have pastor give you a sermon. <laughs> no, no, you, you put that kid down for that. Have you ever been hangry before? Right, do, do you need a devotion? No, you need a snack. You need a sandwich. We, we recognize sometimes that there's a physical and spiritual connection in our bodies. And sometimes the way to address the spiritual thing is to start with the physical thing. And that's very true for anxiety and here's why. Uh, right in the middle of your skull is a tiny thing about the shape of an almond called the amygdala. You ever heard of that before? Uh, The amygdala is an amazing invention from God that I think is meant to keep you safe from danger. For example, if for some crazy reason an actual lion, a roaring lion, came like prowling and pouncing down the center aisle of this church, your amygdala would immediately light up and trigger the systems of your body into a fight or flight response. Um, In that moment, if there was an actual lion, you wouldn't need like the complex thinking of your prefrontal cortex to solve difficult equations or memorize Bible passages. And so your amygdala would reallocate the blood from the thinking part of your brain to your muscles so you could fight back against the lion. Um, You wouldn't need to worry about good digestion if a lion was about to digest you. And so your amygdala will take blood from your digestive system and send it to your muscles so you could run faster than ever before. When you're in danger, the amygdala keeps you safe. But here's the problem. Uh, Your amygdala is famous for false alarms. 
It often triggers the same response in your body, even if there's not a lion in church, even if you just thought about a lion being in church. You ever notice sometimes when you're anxious, you feel sick to your stomach? One of the reasons is because your your body is literally (laughs) taking some of the energy it would put into your digestive system and triggering it into your muscles. And the reason I want to tell you that is because, do you remember what I said about the blood being taken from your prefrontal cortex? The place where you think about the promises of God, you think about what's true and logical, you're nuanced in your thinking. If your amygdala is firing, your brain isn't ready to think. So guess what you need to do? You need to breathe. Uh, Deep breaths literally use your nervous system in reverse to tell your amygdala, whoa, it's okay. Like, if you can take a deep breath, you're not running from a lion. And so you're actually telling your brain, I'm not in danger. I can get back to thinking. And then your brain is ready to open the Bible and study what God has to say. I recently read a great book about uh, raising young girls with anxiety. And uh, the author compared breathing to this. Uh, This is a glitter jar. It's glitter and water and glue. And I hope the cap is on tight or this is going to get awkward for me. (laughs) Yeah, when you feel anxious, this is what happens inside of you. Just swirling thoughts and fears and you're unsettled. And if I came to you when you were super anxious, you know, and wanted to get scripture into your heart, there's like too much in the way. So guess what you have to do? You gotta start to settle the glitter. And it might take a few breaths or a few minutes, just like this glitter jar. But then your heart and your mind will be ready to hear the comforting promises of God that can take away your anxiety. There's not a Bible passage for this, but, but I think Psalm 139 that says, God, search me, see if there's any anxious thought within me. It also says that you are fearfully and wonderfully made. Remember how God created you and you'll know exactly where to start. Breathe. And once you do that, you're ready for step number two. If you're taking notes, step two is to pray. To pray. I mentioned there are 30 separate passages on worry in the Bible. Two of them from Peter and Paul tell us to do this very thing. Uh, Remember what Paul said in the reading Pastor Bill shared, do not be anxious about anything. But in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And then Peter agreed. Uh, He said in 1 Peter chapter 5, cast all your anxiety on God because God cares for you. Talk to God. Bring God into the room or Start to pray and recognize that God is already there. 1 Peter chapter 5 is the same one that says the devil is like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. And when the devil's roaring at you or just whispering at you, when he's making you freak out that everything's going to fall apart and God isn't in control and you're not going to make it to heaven, it's so important to bring God back into the picture. It's hard to fight against the lion But Jesus can. Jesus can stick him in a cage. He can conquer that lion. He can put him to death. So pray. Even if it's a freaking out prayer. God, I'm worried. Help! Your father knows your heart and you don't have to come up with the perfect words or write a 200-word essay. Just bring God into the picture so he can fight your battles. Before the end of church today, we're going to sing a song called Sea of Victory. And I think about that. Like, I would see a defeat if it was just me against my worry. But if God is fighting my battles, if Jesus, the King of kings and Lord of lords, shows up in the room, then this little worry that's been roaring at me and bullying me all night, that doesn't stand a chance. So pray. There's a woman at our church who does that very thing. 
Uh, for a couple years now, I've known her at our downtown campus as uh, a Christian woman who's been through a lot in life, but she's come through with an incredibly resilient faith. The other day we were in the core lobby and she just mentioned in passing something I had never heard her say, that anxiety has been part of her entire life. And I was kind of surprised because she seemed so you know, confident and strong in her faith. And so I emailed her and I asked her, well, how do you deal with it? And uh, she said that I could share her story with you. Uh, her anxiety started because of her abusive father. Uh, she was raised by a very bad and dangerous man. And so as a little girl, she always had to be on high alert. Her body always had to be ready to run. She, she always had to think about what kind of mood her dad was in or what she would say or what would set him off. But as she got older and got away from that danger, she realized that her brain thought about everything in that way. Always on high alert, always have to be anxious, always have to be worried about the worst case scenario. And she had to figure out, how do I fight this? How do I deal? And so I asked her the question, well, how do you? This was her answer. I don't. I don't handle it because I can't handle it. It is only through Christ that my victory is found. I love that. This is bigger than me. I've been through stuff in life and man, I, I, can't, I can't just change the way my brain, my heart instinctively thinks. But if I bring Jesus into the equation, I could see a victory. Because Jesus could fight the battle for me. And I want to encourage a lot of you to do the same thing. Invite Jesus into the room. Put up a cross on your bedroom wall. Have a short prayer that you've written in your clearer moments that becomes your, your 911 so that you can cast all your anxiety on God because, Peter says, he cares for you. He's never too busy and he's never bothered. Your Father in heaven has never once rolled his eyes and said, this again. He cares for you. And he cares about everything. So don't be anxious about anything, but present your requests to God. Pray. Breathe. Pray. If you take notes, number three, seek. I mentioned the 30 passages that use the word worry. Did you know eight of those passages all happen in the same teaching? Uh, in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 6, it's repeated in Luke 12, uh, Jesus talks about worry, the, the birds of the air, the flowers, your Father in heaven knows what you need. Some of you are familiar with that section. Uh, here's what Jesus said in Matthew 6. Therefore, I tell you, don't worry about your life. <laughs> okay, <laughs> that's pretty all-inclusive. But here's what you should do. Jesus says, seek First, God's kingdom and God's righteousness. I, I love those words. That's kind of fancy Bible talk. Let, let me define those two phrases. Seek his kingdom and his righteousness. Um, God's kingdom is the place where God is the king and he keeps people safe. You know, think back in the first century, um, the king who might have ruled in Jerusalem, there were big walls and the king would rule with authority and use the royal army and the towers and the gates and the bars and the guards to keep dangerous things outside. Jesus is saying, seek in your mind, start to think about the fact that through Jesus, faith in him, you live inside the walls. Right? And Jesus doesn't let the roaring lion through the gates. Now, you can hear him roar in this kingdom. And you can shiver in fear as you lay in your bed. But if you're a follower of Jesus, you are already part of the kingdom of God and your king is going to keep you safe. The walls are so high in the kingdom of God that the devil can't take a running start and jump in and get you. Which means King Jesus will keep you safe. The Bible says things like this. Um, no one will snatch my people out of my hand. No one. You think the devil's going to get you? You think you're going to lose your faith? You think you're going to end up in hell instead of in heaven? Jesus says, no one will snatch you out of my hand. 
It says in Romans 8, the people that God called and justified are the ones he will glorify. If God called you, if you have faith in this moment, you are going to get to the finish line. The book of Philippians says that the God who began a good work in you will carry it to completion. So if you have faith now and you're worried, I'm not going to get to the end. No, he will. The Bible says the Holy Spirit who is in your heart is a deposit guaranteeing what is to come. You know what guarantee means? Guaranteed. (laughs) He's going to do it. God is good at his job. Seek first his kingdom, that my king is not some weak little prince. He's Jesus, the king of kings and lord of lords, and demons used to shake in his presence. That's your king. Remember that. And you won't have to worry about life. And don't miss the possessive pronoun. Some of you St. Peter students, you remember the possessive pronoun? His. It's his kingdom and it's his righteousness. Um, let, let me tell you what anxious people often do. They often think about their righteousness. Am I doing the right thing? Am I believing the right way? Am I good enough for God? I, I'm worried. I'm, I'm still worried. I, I know better, but I keep doing this. And they keep wondering about me, my righteousness. Have I done enough right things to be right with God? And that's why I love the pronoun his No, seek his righteousness. Jesus did the right thing. Jesus went to the cross to make you right with God. Don't think about yourself. Don't stand in front of the mirror. Stand in front of the cross. Seek his righteousness. And maybe, maybe, maybe you'll know how not to worry. Uh, That's what one brother in the faith does. Uh, I know one guy who's extremely passionate about God. Um, He's actually a ministry leader here in the Fox Valley. And he worries a lot about his own salvation. Can you imagine? Can you imagine being a a Bible teacher and teaching people how to be saved and wondering after the class is done if you're saved? So I emailed him. I said, how do you deal? This is what he told me to tell you. Quote, Mike, When you see people sitting in those chairs or pews, make sure they know that Jesus loves them even when they're not trusting Jesus as they should. Let me assure you that if your faith is weak, if you worry too much, he still loves you. Jesus said, don't worry. To his worrying disciples. And said, seek his righteousness. So I Psalm 94 is one of my favorite passages of the 30. It says this. When I said, my foot is slipping, panicking. Your unfailing love, Lord, supported me. Yours. When anxiety was great within me. Not just regular anxiety. Great anxiety. Your consolation brought me joy. I have never loved a possessive pronoun so much. Not my unfailing love. Not I never fail you, God. Not my consolation. No, no. when I'm messed up, when I'm rattled up inside, it's your unfailing love, your consolation, your kingdom, and your righteousness. Seek that. Seek Jesus. And you'll know how to deal. First, you breathe. Then you pray. Then you seek. And finally, you group. Uh, There's a great sister in faith here who runs a life group on anxiety and depression. Uh, I asked her, what have you learned? How do you deal? How do you help people here in our ministry? And this was her quote, group, comma, group, comma, group, comma, group, comma, group, period, end of quote. Uh, Have you ever noticed when you're worried, you kind of get stuck in your own head? Trying to be logical or reason with yourself is pretty hard. That's why God gave us church. That's why watching at home is an amazing blessing. It's a great thing to connect with the gospel. But as much as we can, we don't just want to sit at home. We want to do life together. We want to live in a place where there's pastors and brothers and sisters and leaders who care about our soul. 
We want to be part of a community where we can say, I'm freaking out. I'm anxious. I'm forgetting about Jesus. And there are people who will help us breathe and they'll help us pray and they'll help us seek. Uh, it is such a gift to be able to be honest about your own anxiety. And that's how we want it to work at our church. You know, maybe you're part of the 80% that doesn't deal with chronic anxiety, but we, we really do need you. In every life group you join, in every family you're a part of, uh, we need you to be the kind of compassionate, selfless people who help. Proverbs chapter 12 says this, Anxiety weighs down the heart, but a kind word cheers it up. When we're anxious, it's hard to speak kind words to ourselves, but people on the outside, a father, a friend, pastor, sister, can speak the kind word of the gospel to cheer up our souls. And so if if you're trying to deal with anxiety, I encourage you to join the life group. You could sign up like today after church is done to be surrounded by a group of people who gets it, who knows it, who has no judgment, but who will take you by the hand and lead you back to Jesus. So, how do you deal? First, you breathe and you pray. Third, you seek. And finally, you group. I want to leave you today with a picture. Ah, Literally. Uh, This picture means the world to me. Uh, If you offered me a thousand dollars after church, I would not sell this to you. Because this picture is the way that my family deals with anxiety. A few years ago when anxiety became a regular visitor in the Navani home and an unwelcome guest, we bought and framed this picture. And when we're anxious as a family, we sit down together And we stare at it. We think about ourselves as this little lamb, defenseless against the roaring lion, but confidently held in the mighty arm and hand of our Savior Jesus. We think about the king of God's kingdom, Jesus himself, who's not sweating, not trembling, not worried. He's sitting because he's in control. We see that pen in his hands as he writes every plan for the future of our life so we never have to worry about the what-ifs and what-abouts and things we can't predict or control. But most of all, we look at that little spot in his hand where he was pierced so that we would always be right with God. So that today when we pray, we know that God cares about us. And so one day when Jesus comes back, we know we will not be judged but saved. Save from sin. Save from the struggle. That's how we deal. Does that picture fix it? Sometimes. Does that picture bring us back to Jesus? Always. And Jesus? He's how you deal. Let's pray. Oh, dear God, thank you so much for your unfailing love. Um, I get sick of myself sometimes, uh, the things I struggle with now that I struggled with 30 years ago. But you still care and you're so gracious and that's why I worship you. Thank you, Jesus, for being the Lamb of God. Before that lion devoured us in our weak faith, you allowed yourself to be devoured on the cross so that his lies would be silenced and so that we would be yours forever. I pray, God, for everyone who's anxious here today. Please send your Holy Spirit to give them confidence to know that even if today's a bad day, you're still a good God. And you are good at your job of forgiving and saving struggling souls. Finally, I pray for our church, Father. Anxiety is rampant in our culture and it doesn't look like it's going away. Uh, let this church be a refuge, a little glimpse of the kingdom where we keep people safe from worry and fear by proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ, the good news that takes away every fear. Finally, Jesus, come quickly. I can't wait till this struggle is over for me and my family. I can't wait till it's over for our church family. 
So come quickly. Give us strength and patience as you save soul after soul until the moment is just right when we see your face and our worry will be a thing of the past. We wait for that day, but we wait in faith. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.